Hey, thank you, Brandon, and Merry Christmas to everyone. It's so good to see you. You can go ahead and grab your Bible. Uh, we're going to dive into an amazing passage of Scripture here. Uh, just want to say, if you haven't got, uh, haven't received or grabbed one of these, our, our devotional guide, it's out there right when you leave this room right now, and uh, grab one. We've got a long way to go still. This is an amazing uh, piece that our, our, our group has put together, and uh, I've been walking through it every day. Our whole church family wants you to join us, so make sure you grab one. Uh, grab some for your family so that everybody can, can do it, all right? And point others. It's online, too. If you, if you have family members who are out of town, anybody anywhere on the planet can do so, all right? Uh, tonight, we've got the majesty of Christmas. It's going to be amazing. Christmas time is here, and I love this time of the year. Today, we're talking about awaiting Advent, and uh, today, we're going to focus on awaiting his rescue. Last week, we talked about wait, awaiting his promise Um, We love a story of rescue. There's a lot of books out there on rescue stories, Um, a lot of movies we we go see. Maybe you have needed to be rescued. Have you ever been, think about that, you've been in a situation where someone had to come help you, maybe a tow truck, maybe a car broke down, flat tire. I must admit, Stacy has come to rescue me a few times out of many things along the way. But um, we love a good rescue, right? And we're so grateful for the person who has helped us, uh, who's rescued us. Uh, we, we read stories of, gosh, I read climbers who get rescued, like at Mount Everest, or somebody's out in a boat somewhere, gets rescued. Children, those are hard stories at times, but they get rescued, you know, is really amazing. Um, some of y'all remember, how about miners getting rescued? They're like 10 years ago, 33 Chilean miners. Do y'all remember this? For 69 days, they're caved in this cave. They're down in this mine. Everybody's watching, wondering what's happening. Uh, years ago, some of y'all have read about this. It happened in Midland. Some of y'all are old enough to remember baby Jessica. Anybody remember this? Show how old you are. Yeah, see? Okay. You remember this. And in Midland, Texas, she is a little 18-month-old, y'all. And, and kids, students, listen to this. 18 months old. She's in the backyard of her aunt's house in Midland, Texas. She falls into this well, into a well casing. She's down in this bottom of the well. And everybody in the nation's watching this. Like, I mean, everybody, and, and she became everybody's baby um, during that time. And we, like, celebrated when she was rescued. About a month ago, closer to home here in Texas, um, in Grimes County, it's just east of College Station, kind of northeast, northwest of Houston, um, a little boy named Christopher Ramirez was, was gone missing, three years old. And uh, you may have seen this on the news. The last they saw him, he was playing with a dog. They believe he, he followed the dog into the woods. Three days he's lost in the the thick woods out in this rural area in Grimes County. And there's this one guy, everybody's looking for him. Everybody's praying for him. All these agencies, coalitions come, like 40-something groups. And this one guy, his name's Tim Halflin, and he's in a Bible study on a Friday night with his friends. They're all praying, and he he, he tells later, the Lord impressed on him, he needs to go find this baby. He's going to go find him. And he's praying, he's like, Lord, I'll go find him. And so right near his house, sure enough, he goes out looking for little Christopher. Now, let's pause for a moment and thank God for Texas. Okay, can we do this? Did did you hear me? This guy is at a Bible study on Friday night with his friends. And he's praying and God lays on his heart that he's going to go find this little boy. Thank God for Texas. Okay, so he goes out not far into the woods. And he finds little Christopher. And he's, he's all alone. He goes over and he, he picks him up and he, he takes him home. And later he's on like Good Morning America, all this stuff. Everybody in the area is celebrating. It made news here. I mean, it made national news. And, and he said, he goes on. He's saying, well, I just, I was praying. The Lord just prompted. He said, you need to go help find this little boy. And I'm going to lead you to him. He says, and it was divine intervention. I found him. I don't know. I can't explain it. I'm just telling you. And we all, we all like, yes. You know, we love a good rescue story, right? Maybe you have experienced what some of us as parents have experienced on the other side of this, where you're in a, in a store and, or somewhere and suddenly your child is not where you think they are. Anybody done that? This panic moment where you've got to find this child. And then when you find them, you just celebrate. Well, every story of rescue that we love turn into books and stories and songs and whatever else, news stories that we just celebrate. Everyone on pale in comparison to the rescue 
that we're going to talk about today. Of God's rescue of us, sinners in need of salvation. And we're going to look at a passage, arguably the most, most explicit passage of prophecy in all of Scripture. It's called the Suffering Servant Passage. Anybody know where this is? It's in Isaiah 53. I want you to turn to Isaiah 53 because we're going to dive into uh, this passage, which is an amazing, again, amazing passage of Scripture. Now, let me just say this. Um, Last week, if you were with us, we were in Isaiah 9. We're we're in Isaiah throughout this um, Christmas season as we're talking about awaiting Advent. Advent means uh, arrival or coming. We're awaiting his coming. All of creation is waiting. All of creation was waiting. Israel was waiting for a savior, for a king to come, not the kind of king they anticipated. And even now we're still waiting. Paul says in the New Testament, we're all groaning inwardly, awaiting new creation. And we know it. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be, but there's coming a day. We've been singing about it even today. But a king would come. And in Isaiah 9, we looked last week. He would come as a child for unto us. This baby is born, and he's going to be a king, and he's going to rule. He's going to be a wonderful counselor. He's mighty God. He's the prince of peace, and and he's going to rule with justice and grace and wisdom. And of his kingdom, Then there's there's no end. It's a forever kingdom. So we're all kinds of these these images in in Isaiah and these prophecies, even what Han was reading earlier, and you're like, wow, eh, what? And what's that about? And today, we're going to see a passage that brings clarity, much more clarity, to who this king is. Because Israel is about to be taken over by the Assyrians in this moment. This is 700 years before Christ is born. And and Isaiah is saying, listen, because of the judgment of God upon you, because you've turned away from him, Assyria, Babylon's going to come. And it happens, okay, that they are taken out. Jerusalem is about to be wiped out. And that's what Isaiah is prophesying about, saying, man, you guys better turn to God. And then, sure enough, it happens. Now, it's worth noting that this passage in Isaiah... Some of y'all know of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I've been to the Dead Sea Scrolls. This Qumran community, um, these, these caves where they found what many would say the greatest archaeological discovery of all time, uh, certainly of the, of the past century, in 1947. They found the uh, large portions of Isaiah. And this passage, by the way, Isaiah 53, is found there proving several things, proving that the scriptures we have has, have been, have been uh, transferred or brought to us, if you will, exactly as they were 300 BC. This is now 700 BC when Isaiah first said these things, penned these things. And now we have scripture that's pointing to Jesus 300 years. We have 700, again, is when this was originally uh, prophesied that Christ would come. And, and I'm saying all that because this, a lot of people think it, like scripture transferred and then we lost this and then somehow they did this. And then I heard somebody, when I was in college, somebody said, Shakespeare wrote a good portion of scripture. You know that, right? Like, I, I, don't, think, I don't think that happened, but okay. Um, so everybody has all these ideas. My point is 700 years, 300 years ahead of time, we got manuscripts saying this about Jesus before he's ever born. And you're going to see, as we look at this, you're like, this is Jesus. Because the first thing I want you to see, okay, we're, we're going to look at how this rescue is a surprise. This is why we have a hard time with this. He comes as a surprise. Our rescue has come as a substitute. I'm going to spend most of our time there. Our rescue comes as a sacrifice, and we're preparing our hearts uh, for the Lord's Supper here. So first thing I want you to see, our rescue comes as a surprise. You're in chapter uh, 53 of Isaiah, watching me online or you're here in the room, I hope you have your scripture open because we want to look heavy into this. I'm going to actually back up because uh, most scholars would say, yeah, it actually starts in Isaiah 52 um, because we're going to look at this entire passage together and apply it and see how God speaks to us. The Messiah will not come as they anticipated. So they're anticipating a king. Keep that in mind. They think he's going to come in a certain way and we still think he's going to come and show up in a, in a certain way. We want, even still, those who are in power to fix all things that are not right in the world. And in this upside-down kingdom, that's not how it works, not the way we anticipate. We still want the elite to come and rescue. We want political powers to come and rescue us. If our greatest need, friends, listen, was, was information, God would have sent an educator. And some of us think, well, just learn more. Learn more about scripture. It'll change me. It'll learn. Yes, learning, yes. But just to have knowledge doesn't change anything. If our greatest need had been technology... Then he would send a scientist or some IT expert, right? If our greatest need was money, a lot of us live that way. If our greatest need was finances, he would have sent an economist. If our greatest need was pleasure, he would have sent an entertainer. 
Instead, our greatest need is forgiveness, and he sends a savior to rescue us from our sin. And this is what we see here in Isaiah 52. Watch this, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act justly. So he's been talking about this servant. This is one of like four passages that speaks of his servant. My servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. Like what? What is this? Now, as we move on here, it becomes very clear that this, this is the Messiah. And, and this, we, we're going to see here, this is Jesus. So if it's so clear for some of us and for many of us, why is it not so clear for others? Why did they miss it? Because it was a complete surprise. It's a complete surprise how he would come. Look at verse 14. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Now you're going, wait, what is this about? In chapter 9, he's introduced as a child. A baby's going to be born. He's a powerful king, but now we see he's weak. He's disfigured. He's marred. He's hard to look at. What does this mean? We'll get there. Look at verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Now you're going to see this from verse to verse. You're going, wait, what? Was it, is, that, is that connected with what? What is he talking about? He sprinkled many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they had not heard, they understand. They're awestruck is what it means. They are silenced because this is not what they expected. They're shocked and surprised. And then chapter 53. This rescuer in chapter 53, watch this. Who has believed what he has heard from us. This is Isaiah, again, from prophecy and from those speaking here. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is another way to say the strength of the Lord, the will of the Lord. Who, who's, who's seen it? Who, who saw this coming? Verse two, for he grew up before him like a young plant. Wait, what? And like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. Now, last week, again, let me back up here because it helps. In chapter nine, he said, there's this image that we see all the way back to Genesis three, where then Israel becomes this, you know, the people of God, the nation of God. He raises up Israel out of the Exodus and here's the people of Israel. The prophecy from Isaiah in chapter nine is that Israel is going to be taken down. The Assyrians are coming down. Sure enough, it happens. They, they take over Israel. Jerusalem is going to be wiped out. Even the temple destroyed. So in this place, uh, Israel's described in another strange image of prophecy. Israel's described as a stump that's been chopped, been cut down, and then lit on fire. This smoldering stump. Kind of strange. But then it says, out of this stump, out of this place, out of this dry ground, burnt over, burnt up, destroyed place, there's a seed that's going to be planted there. All the way back to Genesis 3, we see this. This seed, out of this seed in Isaiah 9 is, wait, the seed actually is, wait, this is a man, this is a baby. So there's a seed planted, Genesis 6, planted in a son of Eve, all right? Seed literally planted in Mary. The baby comes forth, all right? But here's the other thing. Israel, it's called Galilee by the time Jesus shows up. That's the place that's first taken out by the Assyrians. Out of this burnt out, chopped down, smoldering place comes the very ministry of Jesus in Galilee, springs forth this king whose kingdom is ever expanding and there's no end to his justice and his grace throughout the world. Here's my point in all that. Some of you are walking through the hardest season of your life right now. Talked to one of our members earlier, said, that's me. This month has been the hardest month of my life. And some of you are going through some hard times right now. All of us are wrestling with something. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe you don't know what's happening financially for you. Maybe, maybe you have been hurt by others. Maybe it's just a challenging scene. Maybe you're going through depression, a real dark time. Maybe What is your burnt stump right now? What is that burnt out, dry place in your life? Because I just want to remind you today, that is where God is planting a seed. The very thing you thought was going to kill you is where God is planting a seed to raise up something new and do a new thing in you. Friends, I'm telling you, this is where he does his best work. The moment we need rescue is when he comes and he says, I alone can pull you out. Will you trust in him? 
Will you believe in him? Will you turn to him and say, Lord, I'm in a bad place. Just come before him and say, God, do this work in me. Let my ruins, even what I've done in my life, let my ruins become the ground that you build upon. Let my ruins, like Jerusalem, like, like, like your people just entering into exile, scattered, let my, the mess that I have made in my life, maybe others have made for me, let it be the place where you plant that seed and do a new work. Let it be the fertile soil of your good work in me. Friend, that's what he's calling you to. Do you believe that he can do this? He goes on to say, who has believed this? Who believes that God is actually capable, willing, or able to do this? Do you believe today that he has your best interest in mind? He is our rescuer. But look at verse 3. He comes as a surprise. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. What, what is this? He, he was, and we esteemed him not. He was looked down upon. He was passed over the message. Um, Eugene Peterson's message says, we treated him like scum. We didn't want to look at him. He's just completely out of place. Our rescue comes as a surprise. And look at this. Our rescue comes as a substitute. Now, this is so powerful. Verse four, surely he has borne our griefs. Look at this. Carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken. Hang on to that word. We're going to look at that. Stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. I've always wondered what this word stricken means. Did some uh, research this week. So Travis Cook and I, um, preparing messages together this week, um, we just totally geeked out on the exegesis of this passage. And I just want to bring you all in a little bit because this is so powerful. Uh, this, this passage comes alive when we understand this word stricken, especially. The word is naga in, in Hebrew. Everybody say naga. Just for fun. I don't know. Just make sure you're with me. I've always wondered what this means. Um, and we don't use this word very often, right? Or, or it's stricken. Unless we use it some, maybe if someone's stricken with a disease, right? They're stricken with illness. Stricken with COVID, maybe. Stricken with the flu. We, we might say that, right? Stricken. And that's exactly what the word means. It's exactly what it means. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second. Look at verse 5. But he was pierced now. For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement. That's not a word we use too often. To afflict penalty, judgment, punishment on, some, on someone for something they've done wrong. Right? Chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Now look at this. He's doing this for us. This is like Isaiah 9. For us, a child is born. For us, a son is given. For us, he's done this and gone through this. And then verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. Like, wait, what does that have to do with what you were saying? He's reminding us, we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, this is Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet God has laid on him... Our sin, what does this mean for us today? Well, if you're tracking with me here, it means everything is what it means. This passage points us to what Christ has done for us. You and I have been stricken with a disease. You and I are naga. Every single one of us. We've been born with a genetic disease called sin, original sin. But the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was stricken. He's afflicted with all our sin. Everything you've ever done, every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit has been taken upon him. So he takes on, watch this, not the disease because he is perfect and without sin. He takes on the symptoms of the disease. All that should have come to us goes to him, even though he was sinless and he takes it on. This is what it means that he's bearing our griefs. He's bearing our sorrows. He carried all the hurt, all the brokenness, all the evil in your life. You have sinned against him. And then look at this, verse seven. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that, that's before uh, the shearers it, it is silent. So he opened not his mouth. This totally describes Jesus in those last days of his ministry and in the last hours of his life. 
like a lamb to slaughter and remained silent before Pilate, silent before his accusers as they beat him. And then in verse eight, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation was considered that he was cut off out of the land. Now think about this. Of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. He was cut off from the land. Now, to fully understand this, we got to understand the Messiah is stricken. The word stricken, this word naga, and this is where I want you to geek out with me a little bit. The word naga in the Hebrew is, we see it 70, let's see, it's 78 times. 78 times in the Old Testament. 61 times out of 78. It's found, there's a couple times here in Isaiah. It's found mostly in, in two chapters in Leviticus, 13 and 14, stricken over and over again. What is chapter 13 and 14 Leviticus about? It's about the laws and regulations around those who have leprosy or skin disease. Those who are stricken with leprosy. What do you do with those people in, in, in the Israelite community? How are they to handle skin disease? They're called out to be holy. You had to kind of be, be perfect. You couldn't, couldn't, they didn't mix life and death. And, and, and leprosy was a horrific and is a horrific disease. That, that disforms the person. In the ESV, the translation for the word naga is disease or diseased. That's ex- spot on. That's exactly what this means. And if you read this whole passage with, with the word stricken this way, it all makes sense. This is an affliction that's contagious. It's feared. Leprosy, even still, you have leprosy colonies and, and you, you didn't want to get leprosy. It's not like, like COVID. I mean, you just want to stay away from somebody because it's contagious. And if it got you, if you get leprosy, you are in trouble. But in their, their time, in theology was, you've been stricken by sin and you need to be out of here. You're, you're pushed away. Look at, again at chapter 52, verse 14. His appearance is marred beyond human, human semblance. Like a skin disease, leprosy mars the skin and the features of the person. I mean, you don't want to look at somebody with leprosy when they've got it bad. Chapter 53, verse 2, we read, he had no form of beauty that was pleasing. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men. They hid their face from him. Lepers were removed from the community. They were cast out because of fear of contamination. And in, this, is verse, this is chapter 13 of Leviticus. So they're cut off. We know enough about, maybe you know enough, about the stories of Jesus in the New Testament where the lepers come to him. He's hanging out with lepers. He's healing lepers because they were cast out. They even had to yell because they're contagious if they came anywhere near anybody. They lived isolated lives, but if they came close to someone, they had to, you know this? They had to shout out what? Unclean! Unclean! I mean, can you imagine? And again, in that theological context, I'm a sinner! I'm a sinner! That's my identity! That's who I am. I'm unclean. That's me. Everybody running. This is the life of a leper. This is the life that Jesus takes on for us. And then in in Leviticus 14, look at verse 10. All right, hang with me. And on the eighth day, he shall take male lambs without blemish. Here's what's happening. There is a way to be reinstituted, to be brought back into the community. If you have leprosy and you're, you're coming forward before a priest, you come before a priest and you could proclaim that you're, you're, now, you're now healed and the priest would then do this. One new lamb, a year old. Look at this, a lamb without blemish. A guilt offering is to be offered. And then look at verse 11. And the priest who cleanses him shall set the man who is to be cleansed or the woman and these things before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, before the tent of meeting, before the presence of God. This person is brought before the priest representing God, the presence of God now before him, consecrated before the Lord, verse 12. And the priest shall take one of the male lambs and offer it as a guilt offering. The lamb is offered as a guilt offering in substitution for the person, okay? And then it's to wave, it says, and then wave them, this wave offering before the Lord. One spotless lamb becomes a guilt offering. Look at verse 14. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, this is strange, and and the priest shall put it on the right lobe of of the person's ear. Okay, now watch this. This is the exact ritual that the priest went through. Moses to Aaron and all the high priests. 
A leper is to go through a very similar, similar ritual, but here's what's happening. The right side, okay, you're going to see they're going to put blood on the right lobe, blood on the right thumb, blood on the right toe. And sorry, lefties, um, right is this, this side of strength, okay? It's, it's where you do your life. It's where you do work. Any left-handed people here? There's grace for that. Okay, I'm just saying. Because um, now in Christ, we're right-handed and left-handed. Praise be to God. Um, but here's what, here's what this means. You put it on the earlobe. Why? The priest to hear from God. You're going to hear from God. The leper's being re-consecrated, re-instituted, once ostracized, sent out, isolated, brought back to the priest before God Almighty. The blood of the lamb is put on the ear so that you can hear from God. It's put on your thumb. Why? Because that's where everything in the world happens, right? We got a disposable thumb. That's what separates us from it. Everything on the planet starts right here. Every giant bridge or skyscraper rocket ship ever built starts right here. It's a sign of your worship and a sign of your service. Sprinkled by the blood of the lamb, now redeemed, consecrated, set apart for God. And the big toe, you're tracking with me, right? Wherever you go. The, the priest is to be consecrated before God Almighty in his presence. This is a total life of worship is what this is. And now God is calling the leper into the same ritual. This is what it means. And then he says in, in chapter 52, verse 15, he's going to sprinkle the nations. He, his blood is for everyone. And then in verse 18, then the priest shall make atonement at one mint, become at one with God for him before the Lord. The lepers pronounce clean after the blood of the lamb is applied. And, you know, in Israel, if you had this skin, you know, affliction, you're removed from community completely. As, as we noted, you're, you're sent into exile. Isaiah's preaching to a group of people who've turned from God, become leprous in their sin. They're going to be sent out, exiled. And yet this goes beyond, like Isaiah does, it goes beyond history, goes into the future to where we are. Now we can be made clean, reinstated, reconsecrated, set apart again. In fact, you know that Israel was originally to be and called to be this kingdom of priests. And then Paul says it in Colossians, we're now a holy nation. We're a kingdom of priests in Christ. We're the new Jerusalem. We're the new Israel. The people of God, forgiven because of the blood of the lamb. And now we were once leprous, right? We were once uh, cast out, sent away, but he is pierced. He's crushed. He's cast out. He's exiled. He's abandoned. He takes all of that on himself. He's crucified. He's the sacrificial lamb, the guilt offering who comes to restore us. He stands like the priest, ready, listen, to confirm you as totally forgiven, pronouncing you fully forgiven, totally clean before God Almighty. Somebody said amen. amen. Praise be to God. Do you know what you've been saved from? You were isolated, separated from God. And if you're here today and you're going, I, I don't know if I've ever made a decision to really receive. How do I receive this? All you've got to do is come before God right now in your heart and just say, Lord, I want to be clean. I need to be clean. Everything you've ever done, forgiven. Every mistake you've ever made, every failure in your life, has been forgiven and all you've got to do is come to him say lord i've exiled myself i've been exiled and i'm a sinner can i come home and the loving priest comes forward he says come home come to me you're made completely clean by jesus if you'll just turn to him totally forgiven only jesus can heal you from this spiritual leprosy of sin only Christ can do this. Only he, watch this, he becomes the sacrificial lamb and the priest at the same time. He's making the offering for you on your behalf and he's the one who proclaims you clean. This is, this is why Jesus hung out with lepers so much. In the New Testament, it's pointing to what he's doing for all of us. All of us are spiritual lepers and Jesus loved hanging out with lepers. 
He never ministered to them at arm's length. And here's what happened. You know the 10 he heals in the gospels? They, they go out. And remember the story? How many came back to, to praise him and thank him for what he did? How many? One out of 10. He says, where are the other nine? Where, where have they gone? Because remember he heals them and he said, y'all go, yourself, go show yourself to the priest. Leviticus 13, 14 is what he's doing. Go show yourself to the priest. One comes back and says, priest didn't make me clean. You did. You're the high priest. You're the savior of the world. You're the one. And so many of us have been rescued from our sin. You might be here today going, I, I'm tracking. This is amazing. God has forgiven me. And yet you're not telling anybody about it. And some of you are here today, you've been exiled from the community, the family of God. He's done all of this and you have not come to join the fellowship of his church. You're just visiting. And we love visitors, guests. Join the family. Because think about this. You're totally forgiven. You're exiled. You're brought back into God's family. If you stay out, not become a... a, a member serving in the body, being a part of what God's doing here, you might as well still be exiled. When you're saved, you're brought back into community. You get your life back. You get to live life with others who are pursuing God as well. And and, and there's no more condemnation on your life or anybody else. We can love others freely now. It's why in in Romans 8, 1, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation For those who are in Christ Jesus. And and this is a word for somebody here today. Self-condemnation has got to end in your life. You need to be done with that. It's what Jesus said to the woman caught in it. No one condemns you. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Our condemnation has been taken out on his son, Jesus. The leper once condemned is no longer condemned. He's set free to live again. To do life again. Our rescue comes as a surprise. It comes as a substitute. Praise be to God. Finally, it comes as a sacrifice as we prepare our hearts for uh, the Lord's Supper together. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. You know, he, he, was, he was buried. Jesus was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's a rich man's tomb. Borrowed tomb. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering of guilt. Wow, a guilt offering. Soul means life. When his life makes a guilt offering, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the Lord, the the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He gives his entire life. And then verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, He shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and shall bear their iniquity. That's the entire book of Romans. We've been accounted righteous because of this atoning sacrifice. Look at verse 12, the last part of this chapter. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes transgressions for the intercessor. Jesus intercedes on our behalf. And then the oft-quoted verse around here sums up this entire passage. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow, what a surprise. What a substitute. What a sacrifice.